You have no idea how hard it was to make the thumbnail for this video. Like having to hold up each of those stacks in one hand awkwardly to fit in frame. Oh, that was like exhausting. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rick and today we're gonna to be talking about the big books tag. Not because everybody is stuck in isolation right now and big books are great when you have a ton of time, but because I love big books. And I cannot lie, other brothers can't, I can't believe I was just about to make that joke. I just love reading big books. They're some of my favorite books and um, I wanted to talk, can we just skip the intro, pretend this didn't happen? So today I'm gonna do the big books tag. I wasn't tagged by anybody because I've been dead for like the last four months, but I watched Jasmine from Jasmine Reads make her video. Uh, about a week ago and I thought it was great, so I thought I would uh, throw my hat in the ring. If you haven't seen the tag yet, basically you're meant to talk about the five biggest books that you have read and then the five biggest books that are left on your TBR. I don't know if these are the five biggest books, A, that I've read or B, that I want to read, but these are, these are kind of 10 books that I'm excited to talk about. So I'm just gonna go in that direction with it. I just think it's gonna make for a better video. I'm gonna start with the five books that I actually have read because I can talk about them uh, a little better because the latter half of this video will be one of my worst nightmares and that is talking about books that I have not read yet. It weirdly freaks me out and I just, I'm already dreading the back half of this video. So let's get started with books that I actually know and like and can speak to. The first book that I'm gonna talk about, which clocks in at 897 pages, is probably my favorite book of all time, and that is I Know This Much Is True by Wally Lamb. FYI, I just saw the trailer for the HBO limited series that's coming out. It stars Mark Ruffalo and it looks fantastic. I read this probably about 10 years ago, kind of on a whim. I don't really know why. It's one of those books that just comes into your life at the right time for whatever reason. I was in my probably early 20s at the time, and at the time I hadn't read many male authors who actually spoke in a voice that I identified with. And as soon as I read like a page or two of Wally Lamb, I just, my whole reading world kind of broke open. And he's been one of my favorite writers ever since, and this is for sure um, the best book that I've ever read. It is about a set of twins one of whom, at the very start of the book, this isn't really a spoiler at all, so it might sound like one, but it's really not. It happens in the first like 15 pages of the book. One of them cuts his hand off um, in a library, basically as a sacrifice to God um, for all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world. And he's, he's basically trying to sacrifice himself if God will fix everything. And then the next 900 pages or so is just uh, about the relationship between these two brothers trying to get him back to a point of sanity while he's in like a mentalist institution, basically. It's one of those books that it's so character driven, it's hard to really describe in a way that makes it sound interesting. The best way that I recommend this book to people is read the first 20 pages. If you're not interested, put it down. If you don't put it down, you'll never stop. It's just that good. The second book I'm gonna talk about, which clocks in at 959 pages, it was my favorite read of 2019. I did a big, long, exhaustive video on it, and that is Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. This book just blew me away. I won't talk too long about it because you can just go back 10 or 12 videos and you can find me talking about this, but um, this was probably the biggest reading surprise, maybe of my entire life. I never thought I would ever read this book and kind of picked it up on a whim just because I found such a gorgeous version of it in a used bookstore started reading it and I just couldn't put it down. I read it twice in just over a month. And yeah, it was it was one of the most surprising, most mind-blowing reading experiences of my whole life. I made a 25-ish minute video on this because it takes that long to talk about. The most interesting part of Gone with the Wind to me is how unbiased I was towards the material. These are the types of people I don't identify with. This is the type of story I don't identify with. And I was so, gripped by this. The idea of telling a story from the losing side of a war that you don't agree with for a thousand pages and have that be just mesmerizing and you're weirdly pulling for certain people that just, that it, in retrospect, it kind of makes no sense. But um, it just goes to show how brilliant Margaret Mitchell is. It's just one of the most beautifully told stories I've ever 
scene and this could have been 3,000 pages and I wouldn't have stopped reading it. It was just, it's that good. Book number three comes in at 866 pages in hardcover and that is 4321 by Paul Auster. This is one of the most inventive books, not only that I have ever read, but I think that's ever been written. And if you're not familiar with 4321, it has one of the most interesting narrative structures of all time. Basically, uh, this book follows a man through four divergent paths in his life. So essentially, it starts off with his birth, and um, each chapter, it's, it's harder to describe than I thought it would be. Basically, um, okay, so at the start of the book, okay, so basically it's this. At the start of the book, Archibald Isaac Ferguson is born, and then... Um, okay, I hate when people do this, but I'm having such a hard time describing what this book is about that I'm just going to read the inside Jack of Coffee because I think it does a lot better job of it than I was doing. So when Archibald Isaac Ferguson is born, Ferguson's life will take four simultaneous and independent fictional paths. Four Fergusons made of the same genetic material, four boys who are the same boy, will go on to leave four parallel and entirely different lives. Family fortunes diverge, loves and friendships and intellectual passions contrast. Chapter by chapter, the rotating narratives evolve into an elaborate dance of inner worlds enfolded within the outer forces of history as one by one, the intimate plot of each Ferguson story rushes on across the tumultuous and fractured terrain of mid-20th century America. A boy grows up again and again and again. So it's just, it's so fascinating to see the small little things that change your life entirely. And like, that fascinates me. I go back through my life constantly and just think of like, I wouldn't be here unless A, B, and C happened. Like for me personally, I wouldn't have met my wife unless she went to an open house across the country. She met a guy at that open house. They dated briefly. And then like, he became my best friend and I met her through him. And just like the weirdest, smallest little things can become the biggest, most important things in your life. And this book illustrates it so wonderfully, so tragically. Oh my God, this is taking so long. I'm gonna try to be a little faster now. Book number four, I don't have to talk a lot about it. That is War and Peace. The version I have um, is actually a three, it's kind of three volumes, it's gorgeous. And it clocks in at like, almost 1600 pages in, in the, the version that I have. I read this along with Laura Fry and a couple other people in a read along back when in my blogging days. Um, and it was one of the most fun reading experiences that I've ever had. I'm not gonna hold the book up. It's, it's literally, it's so heavy. I didn't l love the book. I loved the experience of reading the book and I loved reading it alongside a bunch of really smart people who were pointing out some things that I wasn't noticing. And it's nice actually when you're when you're reading a book and you don't love it, but you get to see someone else love it. That was my favorite part of it, I think. You get to enjoy the book kind of vicariously through other people. And book number five, which might be the biggest single volume book that I own, um, and that is To Green Angel Tower by Tad Williams, book three in the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy which is absolutely gigantic. Look at it next to my head. This book is so big that in the um, mass market paperback edition, which a lot of fantasy or all fantasy was being published that way in the mid nineties when this came out, um, it had to be split into two books when it went out of hardcover. It was just, it was that massive. This is the uh, final book in my favorite trilogy of all time, Memory, Sorrow and Thorn. I've talked about Tad Williams, I think, a lot on this channel because not nearly enough people read him. It's crazy to me that this trilogy isn't like super widely read. It's so brilliant. It's such a wonderful response to the classic Lord of the Rings story. The plucky youngster that has to go out and kind of save the world. This tells that in such a beautiful way, but also really turns it on its head at the most important times. And it has like, Literally five or six of my favorite characters in all of literature is in this series. Oh, I love it so much. Okay, so now we get to the part that I hate, talking about books that I know nothing about. And when I say this, I, I literally know nothing about most of these. Um, the first book I'm gonna talk about, which actually I think um, Jasmine also talked about in her video, um, and that is Michelle Faber's The Crimson Petal in the White, which comes in at, this is a hardcover book that is 833 pages. I literally know nothing about this book. I saw it in a used bookstore, pretty good condition, so I got it um, because I had read Faber's 
book, um, The Book of Strange New Things, and loved it. I'm not gonna read it out to you, but I'm just gonna check to see what it's actually about. This is the first paragraph on the jacket copy. How interesting is this? Can we transform ourselves into whoever we wish to be? Or is our future scripted by our past? Can innocence and affection be reclaimed from the ugliest extremes of corruption and hate? Where are the dividing lines between nurture and abuse, faith and fanaticism, love and prostitution, grace and shame? Whew, that doesn't make you wanna read a book, nothing will. Okay, so it takes place in 1870s London about a young 19 year old girl named Sugar who is a whore in a brothel who eventually leaves that and gets to kind of ascend through the strata of London society. That's fascinating. There's actually a quote on the back that I just wanna read because I just wanna talk about it for one second. It says, erotic love, sin, familial conflicts, and class prejudice, a masterwork that will hold readers captive until the final page. Are there phrases you see in blurbs that you just don't believe anymore? Like things like, will hold readers captive until the final page. That is such a corny, cliched phrase. I just don't buy it. Like anytime I see Tour de Force, I just think that book actually sucks and they're trying to sell you on it. Like that makes me a little nervous. The next book I'm gonna talk about is not Moby Dick, but um, thematically it's very relevant because it's kind of my white whale. And that is a 1,030 page book called The Instructions by Adam Levin. Um, this isn't the longest book I own, but it's certainly the thickest book I own. This is like, I don't understand, like, obviously the publisher wants this to be a big epic book and, the, and they want you to think that it is as soon as you pick it up because it is. Um, but like some books are just needlessly thick. Like that doesn't have to be that thick. Like I just want to like, these two books are basically the same length. That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's like less than half the width, that's insane. Yeah, uh, The Instructions is kind of the book that I've wanted to read, um, kind of my rainy day book for the last six or seven years probably, and I just haven't gotten up the courage to actually read it. So the book takes place over four days and it follows this kid named Gurian Maccabee, um, who's been kicked out of two Jewish day schools and has been sent to this place called The Cage, which is kind of a school for um, kids that have been misbehaving. And when he was expelled from those other schools, he was cited for having acts of violence and messianic tendencies. So it says when he goes to the cage, Gurian becomes a leader of a very different sort with righteous aims building to a revolution of troubling intensity. Yeah, it's just, it's so exciting to me and also so terrifying. This is the book that with all the free time that I have on my hands this summer, um, I really hope I get to this, but Based on my track record, I probably won't. The next book I'm gonna talk about, the one that I was holding up against it, um, comes in at 998 pages, and that is uh, Shogun by James Clavell. How annoying would that be to write a book that comes in at 998 pages in paperback? Like, just make it a thousand pages. Like, so that you can say like, you made a thousand page book. Like that would annoy the crap out of me if I wrote a book that ended up being 998 pages. I think Shogun's another book that most people um, kind of know enough about, so I'm not gonna go into huge detail about it. It's about a bold English adventurer, an invincible Japanese warlord, a beautiful woman torn between two ways of life and two ways of love, all brought together in an extraordinary saga of time and place aflame with conflict, passion, ambition, lust, and the struggle for power. And there's a quote from the New York Times book review that says, I can't remember when a novel has seized my mind like this one. It's not only something you read, you live it. The next book is probably the one that people have read the most watching this video. And that is uh, 1Q84 by Murakami. Um, this is a bit of a cheat. This book, this version I have is actually split into three books. Uh, I've actually read book one a couple of years ago and for whatever reason I stopped because I was loving it. Uh, oh, actually I know why I did stop. Because it's so long, like the book, it's gotta be, oh my Lord, are you kidding me? 1157 pages long. What I usually like to do with huge books, um, well, I'm just gonna put this back in the slip case. So then I can keep talking to you without being distracted. 
What I usually like to do with huge books is read them, but I also listen to them intermittently on audiobooks. So while I'm kind of traveling or going back and forth to work, I can still technically be reading the book even when I can't physically be reading it. It just helps me tackle it better. And I did that with this book and the audiobook just totally sapped the life out of it for me. Um, it's just one of those really bland narrations that just turn a book that was really interesting and fun into something that just feels like a slog and that just totally sucked the life out of it for me. So I definitely want to get back into it. Now that I say that out loud, it just pisses me off that that's what happened because I was really, really liking this when I stopped reading it. So um, yeah, I'll get back to it for sure. I really liked it. And last book that I have here, uh, I actually got this within the last couple of months and I, I ordered this um, just from the depths of the dark web it was really hard to track it down. Um, I got this when I rebranded my channel to be entirely Canadian focused. I bought this book because this is the longest book ever published by a Canadian author, uh, including the acknowledgements at the back. Whew. Hunger's Bride by Paul Anderson is 1,356 pages. Um, this thing is just, it's printed on pretty thin paper and it is absolutely gigantic and it's really wide as well. Here you go. Uh, a beautiful and prodigious Mexican nun before signing a vow in blood and falling silent two years before her death was arguably the greatest writer of her time. Centuries later, a Calgary academic finds a box of papers addressed to him in the apartment where his student and former lover lies bleeding and near death, leaving him the prime suspect. Brilliant, caustic, and possessed, she has recreated the extraordinary life and mysterious silence of this nun in the last days of the Spanish Empire and presents a spellbinding puzzle of her own. Apocalyptic, erotically charged, and sumptuously evocative of the Spanish Empire's dying days, Hunger's Brides is an epic novel of genius and obsession. Like, holy crap, that sounds so good. Um, it'll have to take me an entire season. <laughs> to read it. It really surprises me that there's like, there's a Wikipedia article that you can find. Just, just Google like longest books ever or something like that. Um, and I think it has like a list of like the top 25 longest books of all time. And I'm shocked that this actually isn't on there. It goes by word count, not by page count, which makes the most sense. Um, but I actually, on my list here, two of the books that I have read, um, To Green Angel Tower and War and Peace, these are two of the 25 longest novels of all time, apparently, based on word count, which is kind of cool. I don't know how many people can say they've read at least two books on that list, so uh, that's kind of nice that I have. Hopefully I pointed out one or two books that you might want to go read. If you've actually read any of these books, please let me know, especially if it's one of the five books that I haven't read yet. And with that, I guess we'll uh, say goodbye. It's getting to the point in isolation where like my hair is getting to a level where I'm, I'm starting to realize that like I'm going to have to cut it at home or my wife is going to have to cut it at home and just scares the crap out of me. Like I have this weird thing about my hair and getting people to cut my hair who don't normally cut my hair um, or in this case cut hair at all. Um, it's like this weird fear of mine, which makes no sense because I have literally the simplest like boy haircut of all time, like anyone who even has passing knowledge of how to do this should be able to cut my hair. Um, but it just, it's, it scares the bejesus out of me. What a weird way to end this video.